Hurry up, Briggsy. Shake a leg. Get a move on. Oh, la, 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 la. A few weeks ago, a game called Hunt Down the Freeman was released. To put it bluntly, it's abysmal. There are feature-length videos talking about how bad it is. On top of that, it was using assets that appear to be stolen from other games and mods. I saw some people calling this the biggest scam in gaming, but I remembered a story very similar to this one, and not too long ago, actually. Imagine a game that stole at least 10 times as much stuff but got a physical release. Well, it's here. It's actually right here on my desk. Highly enjoyable. I was immersed within the first few minutes. I've never heard of any of these websites, but I do agree that it is a highly enjoyable game. As you can tell from the title, this isn't just going to be a review this time. It's going to be a little different. So in the spirit of Hunt Down the Freeman, I'd like to share a game that's so bad it's good, but also so much more. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Forget reality. Surrender to your darkest dreams. This is maybe the best advice you'll get in the whole game. When you start it up, you get a cutscene of someone falling through fire, and it's from the movie Spawn. I don't mean they ripped it off, I mean they literally took this scene from the movie Spawn, and they just made it their intro. The only thing different they did was putting a border around it. And the border itself? Taken from a World of Warcraft wallpaper. The game hasn't begun, and there are already two lawsuits waiting to happen. This came out in 2008. This wasn't, you know, Wild West Internet. I'm not going to play the whole intro, but there are only three people listed in the credits, and that's probably why. Also, I have no clue what anyone's saying or what's happening. Give a listen to the audio mixing. This will come up again later, but even if you could hear them, it wouldn't make a difference. Finally, we get to the prologue, featuring a vaguely adjusted Battle for Middle-Earth loading screen. Then, it begins. So you are away! Good, good, good! No, no, no! Do not be fearful of me! I am to help, not to hurt! I am friend! Where do you even start with something like this? Well, first of all, the style of cutscene may be familiar to some people. I couldn't understand what it was until later. It's a spiritual successor to the CDI Zelda cutscenes. It has all the ingredients. Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! Arak doesn't tell you about your backstory or why you're there, but he tells you to stay away from the Dark Ones. Well, I guess he tells the main character Briggs, because you, the player, are a character. Yes, yes! Look! They're on the other side! Whoa. Wow. When you finally get to playing, it seems like any typical adventure game. Limbo of the Lost is entirely in 2D, which is awkward. At best, the Briggs model just seems out of place compared to everything else. At its worst, the game just doesn't know how to handle him. A lot of the backgrounds look jagged and awful, and in theory this could be fixed with anti-aliasing. I tried setting it up to maximum, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't do anything. Oh right, like I just said, this is a 2D game, so that's a screenshot. Why well, have the option? That is incredible. Sometimes character sprites will double over each other in different positions. The art style can change every other room. Basically, the visuals are a mess on a technical and artistic level. Some people play adventure games to explore aesthetically pleasing worlds, and this isn't one of those. Limbo of the Lost keeps you entertained by being half freak show and half scavenger hunt. For example, the first room you're in, stolen from Return to Castle Wolfenstein. The entire beginning of the game is. I'm not going to show all of it, so it would take forever. Just seeing what's stolen is fun, but there's so much more. For example, here's going up a set of stairs. That's never explained, it just happens. That's the story for this game. Things happen. Who are you? Oh, faggot's the name, and cooking's my game. <laughs> That's not a joke. The character's name is Cranny Faggot, and we're still in the prologue. Go away. Blackhawk trust no one. Blackhawk only trust birds. I hope you can understand why this is beyond the regular video format. This is going to be a house tour slash history lesson of an insane asylum. I'm not going to show all the good parts, but I'm going to break some things down, show some stolen stuff, and show how it doesn't work.
if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll know that I'm no stranger to sound issues in games. However, Limbo the Lost has a unique one that I haven't seen anywhere else. There are no audio options, not even volume control. Fair enough. I can just lower it in the volume mixer. This works for a little bit. Whoa, what happened? The sound level just jumped back up. Whenever you change a room, your volume spikes back up to your default. I've never seen something like this. I can only guess it's running some kind of check every time it loads a new room and then sets your audio up. Shh. Grunger. The big technical issue is that the game is prone to crashing. It seems to be random, but right here, I can swear that Briggs crashes the game. Well, there's your port report, PC Master Ace. Luckily, you can load from the splash screen. Or anywhere else in the game. If the conversation is going too long and you're worried about crashing, you could just pause the game and save in the middle of it. So the crashing isn't as big of a deal as it should be. By the way, check out the menu. The unpause button being back to hell is pretty funny. But look at the gargoyle. I won't run out of these anytime soon. It's good that the technical issues are for the most part weird and not game destroying. Having a so bad it's good game is much harder than a so bad it's good movie. With something like The Room, you just pop it in and watch Tommy do his thing. This is why good bad games are hard to find. A bad game is like having Tommy Wiseau make the movie, but also the DVD it's carried on, and the DVD player. I've seen some people say that Hunt Down the Freeman is a so bad it's good game, but it's really not. If you're spending more time lost or feeling frustrated than laughing at the works of a madman, it's just not a good bad game. I don't think games that are designed to be broken like Goat Simulator should count for the category, but I'm not the expert. There's just something special about seeing someone's different brain working at full capacity on a passion. Limo of the Lost started development sometime in the early 90s, so nearly 20 years went into this. So the fact that it's functional and relatively hassle-free on a modern system is a blessing. So now I'm going to show you how the game is played. The interface is very simple. You can right-click anywhere in the game world to open up a Ouija board. On an object, you can sense it, look at it, take it, or perform an action on it. In reality, you'll only be using three of these and not sense, because it's useless. It's your sense of smell, but most things in the game you can't smell. No sense, no feeling. 99% of objects in the game will say that. When it comes to inventory, you just mouse to the top of the screen to access it. And you can use your actions on these items as well. For example, if you have a letter, you could use the look command and then read it. Wait a minute. Well, I guess Cranny Faggot likes a drop of the hard stuff. But the menu... Ah. Let me know if you see anything that I miss. Anyway, some of the letters only open main menu options. You won't get all the letters until about the last 10 seconds of the game. Since you also click to move around as well, you don't need your keyboard for any of this. So the controls are fine and the UI is passable except for two flaws. That compass is always spinning. You might be saying, so what, it's spinning around. Well just wait. When the levels will start turning into a maze, this is going to get into your head. To give it credit, it will stop moving when you mouse over an exit, but it might not always stop in the exact right place. Like right here, it stops moving for a moment, but I click there and I can't move off it. It's, nope, that didn't do it. Oh my god. Come on, finally, there we go. Hmm, interesting piece. I saw those skulls just everywhere. Well, once again, it's more Diablo. And a shield of all things. Hmm. Interesting. Naturally, you expect bad adventure game logic for the puzzles. And don't worry, those are there. It just takes it farther into crazy person logic. So now I'm going to go through the game chapter by chapter and show things I thought were interesting. Not all of them in case you want to play it yourself, but enough to give you an idea of what to expect. Ah, I say, we have a visitor. How lovely. Oh, what the... Oh, sorry, I forgot. Hang on. Do not be afraid. Is that better? Dungeon Master. The prologue is brief, but it serves as a perfect introduction to the game. Your main goal is to steal a key from the jailer known as Grunger, or Grunger depending on who you're talking to, and escape the level. To get the key, you need to make a sleeping potion and knock him out and snatch it from his neck, except he's already asleep. Huh. What's interesting is how they were able to weave the stolen backgrounds together into something consistent. Like I said before, the very beginning is from Wolfenstein, but the later parts of the prologue are from a different game, an Xbox hack and slash called Enclave, or Enclave depending on where you're from. This is what you would go out and rent before the Souls games were invented. Back in the day, we just called it Swede Souls, you know, because Starbreeze is Swedish. Man, this reminds you of the good stuff. Anyhow, I went on a sightseeing tour in some games to find the locations. 
A lot of the Limit of the Lost backgrounds are really zoomed in or have the colors adjusted, but it's not enough to hide it, especially if someone's looking for it. However, Enclave is integrated into the game a little bit differently than the others in one area. In the prologue, you meet a trapped character who's hanging in a suspended cage and he doesn't shut up. It's a joke that goes on way too long, but I like the skeleton in the background. You need to collapse the cage so you can grab his arm and then throw it into the sleeping potion you're making. You go to the room above the cages and see the two ropes suspending them. There's a huge lever in the room, but it does nothing when you try to action it. Plus, I can see that these ropes are attached to a gate. Meanwhile, I found the same room in Enclave. They did try to hide this a little bit more by flipping the screen around. Good hustle. So you pull the lever and it raises the gate. The one you can clearly see. In Limbo of the Lost, you have to be Captain Kleptomaniac to put together a torch and then burn down the rope. Meanwhile, no, he can't slash the ropes. Maybe they thought that the puzzles were too similar so made their own torch puzzle to differentiate from it. But in that case, why leave the lever there? Did they not have anybody who could Photoshop it out? I haven't gotten there yet, but it's not even the most blatant plagiarism. Not even close. So what came first, the torch or the lever? Was the puzzle based around a stolen level, or did the puzzle come first and they just made the level fit into it somehow? Well, I think I have the answer. Remember when I said it was in development for nearly 20 years? Well, they released a demo in 1995 for the Amiga 32. The 88th issue of the Amiga Computing Magazine only had some images of it, but the 11th issue of a magazine called Amiga CD32 Gamer had a demo. As far as I can tell, issue 11 has lost the time, but the demo isn't. Time to fire up the emulator. What a stink. And before you say it, it isn't me. Man, gaming used to be so much better back in the day. Forget reality. Surrender to your darkest dream. They kept the same line. Wow, it'll have hordes of monsters. I've got to admit, this game looks a lot nicer than the one they released. Start. Try logic. The Amiga version is actually more of a pain because you have to cycle through more options with the mouse by right-clicking. It's a locked door. What makes it unbearable is if you don't do something for 7 seconds, he stops the game. Hello? This is also a time demo, so I don't want to have to keep restarting it. It's really reminding me of CDI Zelda now. But wouldn't you know it, it's the exact same first puzzle. It. Grabbing the torch, combining it with the human fat, and lighting it in the cauldron. The exact okay, same thing. Nah! This bruise is on to chew, not spew! What a weirdo. This demo is going to have some more importance, but I'm going to put it aside for now. The demo proves that, on some level, there was an original game being made, so it wasn't a complete sham of grabbing things from other games and designing it around that. That being said, there are stolen elements that are just lazy. For example, all the signs are using a Lord of the Rings font. Why not use a font that doesn't need a license? It's a shame because the elements that are original are genuinely bizarre and funny. What the... Phew. So how bad do the puzzles get? The sleep potion isn't that far-fetched, except you also need the Jailer's snot to complete it. Plus, you get your first taste of crazy person logic. Cranny's potion calls for liquor, so you'd think you could find some liquor somewhere, but you can't. You fill a jar with water, combine it with a worm, and then you have tequila. That's dumb, but only a taste of what's to come. I'm back from the sewer water. Here's your booze, Madam Faggot. You wake up the Jailer to give him the potion that puts him back to sleep and then grab his key. And you're done. Grubs up. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> Chapter complete. The tutorial. I'd usually be in the middle by now, but everything's all messed up in this video. And so begins chapter one. I, young man, am the keeper of lost souls. You have done well to get this far. What is this place? To some, this is home. To others, it is a halfway house between their world and the next. This is the key of lost souls. So tell me, am I dead? <gasps> what the? Yeah, let me give you this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't know what came over me. We are off to an excellent start. This is when the levels start to open up and the true madness begins. There are a bunch of coffins you could grab items from, but several of them are red herrings and they don't do anything. 
There are also three items, two of which you need to complete stuff, but you can only hold one at a time. One gift to rule them all. Some of the investigating is odd and lacks visual cues. I use take on an empty eye socket and I get a glass eye out of it. Why not just have an eyeball there? Chapter 1's beginning is all about teaching you not to trust what you can see. Like crossing this bridge that has rotting planks that are breaking apart. All the items I collected didn't help me out, but here's the answer. You go to the entrance of the level and pick up an entire coffin lid. Now you could use it on the bridge to cross. That doesn't look safe to me. Your perspective really gets thrown off in this level. Not long after, you find what looks like a satanic dog bowl. Fluffy. Oh, don't tell me. I was really expecting the dog from Harry Potter. Or maybe the model from the game. Hey, are you asleep? Oh my god, they did it. Alright, I, I see it. And stop. Actually, they are three separate dogs, so it's not a complete ripoff. But then why only show one dog bowl in the cutscene? The world may never know. To keep the dogs distracted, you have to put a bone in each of their bowls. For every bone you put in, a gate opens up. This room is a three-door hub to the rest of the level, so ideally you want all the doors open at once. The only place you can get a bone is from the first room, but you can only carry one at a time. It's about a minute trek each way and there's no special event or challenge, it's just to waste your time. As for the level itself, it's interesting in that it's not only plagiarizing, but also recycling plagiarized material. It's mainly painkiller, the catacomb level to be exact. All they did here was slightly angle the screenshots they took and sometimes slap some signs around. Dead man's drop, dead man's curve, dead man's gorge. I wish I was dead. I wouldn't call it a maze because there's only so many directions you can go, but it is annoying. Like any average adventure game, some stuff you can figure out on your own, but others are just deranged. Oh, thank you, Black Hole, but really, there's no need for... Shh. No buts. Now, go. Do you know what? Every gift tells a story. I would be really excited to see Briggs in the new Smash. While there are more elaborate puzzles to choose from, there's a really simple one that shows madman logic, or maybe four-year-old logic. Eventually, you'll need a soul of a warrior to get past a statue that's drunk and sounds like Predator. You need to switch the real green soul bottle with a decoy that you make yourself. So you fill up an identical looking bottle with water, that's a good start, but what do you mix it with? You use a bag of saffron. Now saffron spice is typically more red colored. The color saffron is named after the tips of the flowers that make the spice. So assuming it is a bag of the spice, it'd be more red colored, but we can pretend that it's all golden saffron tips. So you combine the yellow saffron with the water and you get green? Because water is blue and saffron is yellow and blue plus yellow equals green? Water isn't paint, at least not in my part of the country yet. The first level also has the first of three hidden items. You can only see it if you aim for the left of the stairwell here. It's not horrible, but a little too out of the way. Rest assured, each one of these will be worse than the last. Ah, my favorite. You must take, in exchange for give. I think that's enough of chapter one. Like I said before, I'm only giving you a taste of what's in store. The sewers. What's really incredible is how little you learn by talking to so many people. We're now two chapters in and we only know that we're a chosen one and that we're stuck in limbo. The story offers just about zero intrigue. Like anything so bad that's good, you just keep playing to see what happens. It still might be best to play this game in bursts. The ambient audio never stops looping. But this one soundbite is the worst. It's roughly every two minutes. It's also a stolen sound effect from the Hammer Haunts and Thief. The sewer slash swamp level has the most plagiarized things I could recognize without looking stuff up. The first screen, once you pass into the sewer, is from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Most of the gross sewers seems to be the Hollywood sewers. There's an entire room filled with Morrowind items. There's a set of orcish armor and a bunch of weapon models they just retextured. This won't be the last we see of Elder Scrolls games. Not even close. There's also this Greek helmet in the corner I thought was from Google Images. After looking around, it turned out to be the Dusk Deep helm from Diablo 2. Incredibly, I don't think this is the most blatant plagiarism in the game yet. That won't be until next chapter. Chapter 2 does have one of my favorite stolen assets, the flute. Not the instrument itself, but the song. 
Okay, they had a little Indiana Jones tune. So what? Well, it's more than you think. They didn't bother to whistle the tune themselves, but instead took an Easter egg from Sirius Sam. That is impressive. As for the game, it's very similar to Chapter 1. Once again, there are three main doors, except this time you can only open one at a time. Innovative. The puzzles themselves are becoming more cruel, both narratively and mechanically. Can you see the important item in this room? It's not this panel, not this jar, not the glowing picture on the wall. It's a piece of wood on the back desk. You can only click on about two pixels of it, so you can mouse right over it and miss it. This is the second worst hidden object in the game. As for narrative, at one point Briggs sneaks up on an old man and then puts an iron bear trap over his eyes. That seems a bit excessive, so why would he do that? To take his pen and ink. Reality is slipping. Oh neat, Thor's hammer. Logic is running on empty in Chapter 2, so now we're going to move on to the only real plot and character driven level in the game, Chapter 3. Where the hell am I? Why is the music double overlaying? Dark Mirror. He's very, very worried about you, and I'm a little bit worried myself about being worried about your friend, being worried about you, being worried about this, and I want you to take it so I don't have to worry no more. Oh, thank you, but who? Her audio is way better than the main characters. What's ha what? Dark Mirror is the first time you can learn more about the inhabitants and where you are. It's refreshing. After doing random tasks with very little story drive, it's nice to have some narrative. Briggs has been accused of being a monster called the Soul Taker. You're imprisoned in a very familiar looking cell, but it's not for long. You find your way out. Seems we have found you a crazy injustice, my good fellow. The mayor appoints his detectives, so now you need to interview people, gather clues, and find the real soul taker. You even have a little L.A. Noir clue book. Why is the snow not cold? That's a good start. And so begins the most unbelievable plagiarism in the game. You cannot be serious. Nearly every single interior is ripped out of oblivion. It's not remotely subtle. They copy floor plans entirely. The Shivering Isles expansion had come out just a year before. This could have been on the same shelf as Oblivion. People were actively playing this game, how could they think no one would notice? It's mind-blowing, there's no other way to put it. Out of all the things that people might miss, you took entire levels from a popular AAA game that was still on shelves. Even then, they still managed to screw up the background. I still play modded Oblivion from time to time, so I could go right down to the first edition bookstore. Here he is behind the counter, and here's the back view. You enter the building from the wrong side. The register facing the clerk, the books facing outwards, it's all mixed up. They couldn't even get the chair completely out of the shot. This feels like having an out-of-body experience. The fact that living human beings thought they could do this and make money off of it without getting in trouble is mind-boggling. Now would be a good time to bring up the fire. Since they just screenshotted the level, they needed animated torches. All the fire in the game uses fire.gif. They downloaded a fire gif, put it on the Oblivion screenshot, level completed. It wasn't even the first time in the game they took Oblivion assets, but Dark Mirror is chock full of them. It's Unreal. Literally Unreal. Unreal Tournament 2004. Except they were taking and editing user maps. So they took all these measures to change the map from some map maker, but not the major studio game owned by ZeniMax? Oh my... <laughs> never return to first edition. So what is there to see in Cyrodiil? 
There are several interesting characters. You might not be able to talk to them for long, but what's there is really good. Much like the real Oblivion, however, it's held back by the amount of voice actors they had. Much of Dark Mirror's population is voiced by one guy pitching his voice up and down or making funny voices. It seems we have done you a great injustice, my good fellow. My dear friend and trusted advisor, Onegas here. Hey, can I help you, miss? Uh, actually, it's Mr., not Miss. What? You can't be my sister. I haven't even got a sister. Mister, I'm a man. Uh, for an age, it seems that this has been going on. One after another, they disappear. Souls taken. There are two actors with better equipment, but they have their own issues. Sometimes you can hear the click of someone starting to record it in the background. My pleasure, Mr. Detective. Now, you sure nothing takes you fancy before you go? Detective? Uh, I say, detective, we found another one. Can you hear me? Well, uh, at least he died peacefully. Can you help me find the soul taker? Mon dieu, s'il vous plaît, monsieur. Do not say those two words within this house. Shadows may seek even this place. <laughs> what is this game? Hey, come on. Give her a chance at least. What? Detective Briggs is a mix of both the best and the worst the game has to offer. Exploring the town and finding clues are more engaging than all the other chapters, at least until you hit a wall. Unlike the previous levels, Dark Mirror is expansive. They even give you a map that lets you teleport around town it's so big. Now this is great for a while, but then the game starts trying to trick you. When you and your deputy find another victim of the Soul Taker, sometimes you'll automatically pick up his items. This saves hassle at first, but it doesn't always work this way. Sometimes a cutscene will end and the game will automatically have you leave the area, but you don't want to leave, you want to go back. There are items being left behind that don't show up in the previous screen, so you always want to double check. Here I can see the key on the floor, but the game has me walk right past it and I have to go back and get it. If I wasn't paying attention, I could have been screwed from that and had to look all over town to find the right item. The stolen level design that's not touched up makes it even harder than it should be. That light really is an exit on the Unreal map, but in here it looks like one, but you can't go through it. This Frankenstein of a game isn't even stitched up right. Sometimes an area that had nothing might have items appear there later. Keep checking the journal. If something's not crossed off, you have to go back later. I could follow the plot up until Briggs was hiding in a stable with some terrifying horses. So he scopes it out and he's like hiding in the corner and these characters walk in and then one says horses for courses. I've played this a few times now and I have no idea what this means, but it's the key. That's what the creature was trying to tell me. You mean this guy? <laughs> There was only one point when I was really stuck, and it's a nightmare. At some point when you leave first edition books, you get hit with a snowball. Whoa. The note says there's more than one way in, and I'm glad the game points it out. I'm serious, there's so many typos and spelling errors that you might think differently. I look all around the inn and I don't see any secret passage or switch or button or anything. Maybe the note meant there's another way to go inside the inn from somewhere outside. So I explore the areas around the inn, but I still don't find anything. So here's the answer. The horrible, horrible answer. First, you have to go behind the bar to a very exact spot in the corner. Then you mouse around for a magic pixel. No text prompt comes up, your hand just changes shape for about half a second. You have to be standing in the right place, so I have to keep waving around to do it right. Up, oh, nope, there we go. Now you're in the secret oblivion dungeon. That, by far, is the biggest blocker in the game. Now I can just grab these Baldur's Gate cloaks and be done with it. When I finally found the big piece of evidence, I nearly had a stroke. I'm gonna leave that as a surprise. When you have all the evidence, Briggs brings it to the court. Not since a time to kill has there been a speech quite like this one. He's trying to reach a word count. No, this is an evil, greedy, corrupt society whose lust for wealth and power means that they will stop at nothing to get what they want. The landlord of the very aptly named Inn of Sins. A fine, upstanding people, ladies and gentlemen. These people that you know and recognize, take a good look. I timed it. This goes on for 7 minutes and 45 seconds and you cannot skip it. It actually sounds like an essay being read aloud. He drags out every piece of evidence you found. I could feel myself being pulled into the void when suddenly one of the greatest cutscenes in video games begins. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your soul taker. Yeah. 
The Soul Taker has been banished. Your mayor has been returned. Absolute art. It's never explained what he did. It's great. So it's time to move to the fourth chapter, after the troll removes all of our items. Who do you think you are throwing your weight around like this? The machine. Chapter 4 sucks. Not in a funny way, it just drags out too little for way too long. As far as I know, this map is made entirely from Unreal maps. Way too few. This is a case study in how not to pad out your adventure game. It has a map similar to Dark Mirror, albeit much smaller. All of the numbered tower locations are completely identical, except some have items. Tower 1 and 2 have nothing, a complete waste of time. Tower 3's only item is right outside the train. There's no reason to explore the rest. So there's not a lot to see, but the game knows it. There are two objects that really stick out, but you can't interact with them at all. You have to do other minor tasks, and then they show up and you can pick them up. I don't know why this bothers me so much. Possibly because it was something I expected, but it didn't happen until now. The only good things about it are the cutscenes. There's only a few of them. You can beat it all in 10 minutes. So now is a good time to talk about background stuff before the final chapter. Oh my god, the whole country is a circle. I am Adam, and Benjamin Spooner Briggs, captain of the Mary Celeste. Benjamin Spooner Briggs, captain of the Brigadine Mary Celeste. I like Briggs as a character because well, he's a goofball, but you don't learn a lot about him. You can learn some things from the bonus disc. It's an enlightening piece of media. For starters, it has an entire intro cutscene that's not in the game. Yeah, when you're just thrown into it all with no context, this was supposed to be in front of it. Why it's not actually in the game, I have no idea. It has an intro, credits, titles pop up, and it's way more elaborate than the one the game has. I can only put it down as another mystery. Anyways, the weird vampires in the intro are brothers named Destiny and Fate. But aren't those the same thing? I guess Destiny usually has more positive connotation than Fate, but still. Anyhow, Briggs gets lost in the Bermuda Triangle. It has some live action footage that people debate over the source of, but they definitely didn't make it. It explains that Briggs is on an island and his actions will determine the future of mankind. Those are higher stakes than what the intro implied. Wait, that's the Crisis demo. Maybe they scrapped it because they knew they weren't allowed to use that. It's still incredibly vague, but better than what the game came with. It even shows why Briggs is flying through the big hell portal from spawn. So Briggs is still a goofball and this doesn't change that. But here's where it gets strange. Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs was a real man. His ship, the Mary Celeste, was also real and was found derelict a few days after this game takes place. Briggs and his crew were never seen again. This game is the final legacy of a real, God-fearing sea captain. Grab your Chicago style and get on JSTOR, it's time to learn. Limbo of the Lost was a book originally published in 1969. It got republished in the 70s as Limbo of the Lost, Actual Stories of Sea Mysteries. There were several articles and a few books talking about the Bermuda Triangle before this one, but this helped popularize it. The real course of the ship was nowhere near the triangle, but here's where things get a little tricky. So I went to my buddy Tex from the Black Pants Legion. He's done historical work specializing in maritime history, so he'd be perfect. At this point, I knew that the real Mary Celeste was one of those weird sea mysteries. It was found derelict near Portugal with no crew, all the cargo intact, but a missing lifeboat. Some of the sails and rigging were damaged, but that was about it. Now here's where things get complicated. Sir Arthur Doyle, the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes, had a short story published in 1884. It was in an issue of Cornhill Magazine, and was based on the real Mary Celeste. He just changed minor details and names, like calling the ship the Marie Celeste. The story ended up being so popular that to this day it corrupts historical documents about the real ship. The US Consul in Gibraltar, who had been present at Mary Celeste's hearings, would later make inquiries based on the story's facts. After Tex did some groundwork and things, he found out the big discrepancy. The cargo. Doyle's account puts the cargo value at $35,000, which is worth more than the ship. The alcohol was also going to be used to fortify wines, but that's not how this works. The real ship had 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol, most likely pyridine and methylate spirits. This wouldn't be how port and fortified wine were made. They would use a neutral grape spirit, most likely locally, not from overseas. Not to mention that port was mainly a cocktail mixer in the Victorian era. Shipping booze across the Atlantic to make ratchet peasant wine would have been stupid and expensive. So any account saying the cargo is worth 35k and being used to fortify alcohol is wrong, and written by brainlets. <coughs> this eliminates most accounts of mutiny and aliens. So was Briggs eaten by his crew? A sea monster? Well, the most likely answer came out a few years before this game was made. Dr. Andrea Sella of the UCL Chemistry Department built a replica of the Mary Celeste. 
He simulated a butane explosion from the cargo hold, which made a big fireball but left no signs of burning on the ship itself. This would explain why the ship was damaged but showed no signs of burning due to a pressurized explosion. It explains everything being left behind and no entry in the captain's log, because explosions at sea are scary. So why are there still weird theories? Because there's money to be made off mystery. As much as the simplest solution makes sense, other tantalizing evidence suggests another fate for the Mary Celeste. The first mate's wife claims that on the night of November 25th, she had a dream. No way. That said that her husband had been murdered at sea. Please stop. The new owners of the Mary Celeste then uh, took it to a reef off the coast of Haiti and tried to wreck it there for six insurance policies. They didn't get, they didn't get it. Speaking of scams, the developers claim they didn't steal anything. It was all done by a mysterious person or entity that they outsourced. Well, guess what we're coming back to? Remember the Amiga demo? This hallway is the key. There's another Amiga game called Guy Spy and people have pointed out some striking similarities in this hallway. That's right, even back then, they were ripping people off. This game is legendary. So, let's move on to the final chapter. He mentioned something interesting. Cypher is pursuing new research. He claims that what they're doing in Africa is the missing piece. A weapon to surpass Metal Gear. The Citadel. This is another short one made of Unreal maps, but I like it a lot more aesthetically. The original score, maybe the only thing not stolen, is also really good. The puzzle's just matching up a right hammer with the right head on the wall and you're good to go. Still, for the final level in this adventure, it seems like a letdown. It did seem rational at first, after all they couldn't expect a ton of people to get this far, but then the true final challenge began. It's very dark down here. <gasps> what? my head. Oh. What the hell am I? That is a legitimately awesome buildup. This is a time challenge. Remember where each head was and activate them in order of a panel. This is not a lenient timer. I got all the symbols, but now there's letters. Looks like destiny. The timer keeps going and you don't have time to screw around. You're gonna be at the bottom, so you need to get those letters in as fast as you can. Once you do, you've won it all. I'm saving the best ending for last. This comes after. Fate is upset that Destiny has beaten him and so they opt in for a double or nothing. That's right, they were already teasing a sequel. We both know a lot of reasons why that's not gonna happen. For those same reasons, I would highly recommend checking it out, or getting a copy. Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of legal issues after this game came out, so the retail boxes got pulled. At the time of this video, you can still find wrapped copies for 15 to 20 US dollars, but those won't last forever. This isn't getting a digital release or an enhanced edition anytime soon. For all its problems, it's such a bizarre and funny experience that, for someone like me, I couldn't help but keep going. And nothing reflects its spirit better than the real ending. Thanks for watching. These videos are increasingly harder to make due to scheduling issues, but I'm trying to do it when I can. At some point in the near future, I'll have a special showing of this game on Twitch. Same name as the YouTube one. If you stuck around this long, thanks again, and here's the perfect ending. I can't see a thing. Go on, bring your baby.
Dingalimbo. Well, he's had his ups and he's had his downs. He's had his smiles and he's had his frowns. But I still say he should be crowned. The King of Limbo. Oh, what more can a poor boy do? Working for the likes of me and you. What more can a poor boy say? Well, I could use your help in any way. <laughs> he took his courage to the brink. If it were me, I would turn to drink. Well, uh, well, that's the reason I think he should be the, uh, the uh, King of Limbo. Yeah, he had to be the King of Sims, but at least he kept his daddy limbs. I think that we should be crowning him the King of Limbo. Take it away with you, baby. That's cool. Do up, a do we do up, King of Lim. 